Hi, welcome to lecture three in my course on Heidegger's major work, Sein und Zeit. I'm excited to continue the sort of introductory material I've been presenting in the last lecture in this course. And I want to, in each lecture as we build, I want to give a sense of where we're coming from and where we'll be going in the course. So in the first lecture, I just gave a large overview of the significance of our subject matter, the significance of my approach to it in this format, and sort of a general very simple outline of the argument I'm going to make. And then in the last lecture, I tackled the next, I think, logically appropriate topic, which is the question of method in the interpretation of texts in the history of philosophy. So in a way that had a lot of very concrete material, but it's also a very broad topic. So now I want to narrow in in one sense, that is to say, what do we need to know in order to interpret sign and sight? And so this lecture is going to be about answering a few basic questions. The first on which I won't spend much time because it's actually a, a relatively simple matter is what kind of book is Sein und Zeit in terms of genre or field? Then the second is what are the minimum things that we need to understand in order to interpret this book? And I've mentioned some of that in the last lecture and I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about it today. But then the bulk of the lecture, probably about half of it, will be given to the third and last point, which is a basic introduction to the appropriate context needed to interpret Heidegger's work, which we'll see is metaphysics and theology. So let's begin with the question of what exactly kind of book is Heidegger's work? Now, in one sense, generically speaking, you could say Heidegger's work, um, Sein und Zeit, is a, a technical work of academic philosophy at its peak. Okay, so this is actually quite an important first place to start because people will often complain about Heidegger being difficult. Heidegger is difficult, but the truth is any work of technical academic philosophy will be difficult to a person who is distanced in language, in um, cultural context, and also if makes it even harder in philosophical background from that period. So there were many, for example, clear uh, writers among the Neo-Kantians. I think Ernst Cassirer, for example, is a pretty clear writer overall, but it doesn't change the fact that if a person is coming to philosophy for the first time, um, or they're coming to academic philosophy for the first time, there are definitely much more formidable entry points. And uh, German philosophy kind of at its peak from the 19th through the early 20th and mid 20th century is a very difficult entry point. Um, now related to that is a second dimension of what the book is as a work of academic philosophy, um, a pretty technical work of academic philosophy. And that has to do with the philosophical clock that I mentioned briefly in the last lecture, which is, it's very important to understand that it is not a mythical construct that there is a tradition of philosophy. Um, and what's important is even if you don't believe in any particular construct about what the history of Western philosophy is, which I myself have studied many of those constructs, I recognize that they're all in a sense imaginative reconstructions of our past. However, what they're attempting to imagine is a real story about our past, even if we disagree about how to tell it, which is the chronological development of ideas, which often is very messy, does have an internal logic. And so I stressed we have to place thinkers in their context and we have to place the books that we interpret in their contexts. However, there's very different senses of context. I introduced the most elementary sense from a historical standpoint, which is what I call historical context, is sort of the Weimar period, right? The general period in Heidegger's career and in German philosophy that he wrote to Simon and Sight. That's all context but it's not actually the most essential philosophical context. It's important to have, or you'll distort a lot of things needlessly in your interpretation. But m even more significant than that is what you could call the imminent context. Okay, so the imminent context of a work of ideas is the tradition of ideas that it's part of without an understanding of which you cannot even properly access the text. Now, here's what's quite difficult about this. Um, any technical work of academic philosophy will have at least minimally two traditions of context you could say that it's part of. It will have an immediate academic context, which you need to be able to have some general sense of reconstructing, maybe not because it's so important, but because you won't know whether that context is very important until you reconstruct it. 
And that's basically Heidegger in the context of 20th century early uh, German philosophy. That is to say, everything that was going on with positivism, with um, psychologism, with the neo-Kantian, broadly speaking, critique of psychologism, with the search for the foundation of mathematics in which figures like Brentano, Frege, and Husserl were all important and extremely in many different ways aware of each other to different degrees. The search in general for the foundation, as I said, not just in mathematics, but also of logic and the question of whether you could ground mathematics in logic. Heidegger was very interested in all of this, particularly earlier in his career. Um, he takes a turn that many would see as very anti-scientific, but regardless of how one assesses that, turn in Heidegger's thought, it's quite important to understand he was very aware and broadly speaking informed, at least in the early part of his career, about those questions. And it was kind of inevitable if you were a student of Husserl that you would be taking this kind of material seriously. So that's part of his immediate context academically, but it's also important to remember that part of his immediate context academically is scholasticism. And this is simply an area where ignorance of scholasticism on the part of interpreters of Heidegger simply create major errors. And quite frankly, it's not as if you have to be sympathetic to the religious character of most philosophy to interpret it well. However, it's a fact that many people who are unsympathetic to the religious character of most philosophy in the past, they don't interpret it well. I'm not saying that's because they can't. It's just we all have biases, and if we don't work hard to overcome them, they can affect our teaching and reading and writing and scholarship. So many excellent scholars, just for reasons of personal idiosyncrasy, have very little knowledge of Christian religion, generally, never mind the exceedingly technical knowledge you have to have of the history of theology in order to appreciate, for example, developments in scholastic thought. So that is very important, and scholars too often of Heidegger do not have it. Um, fortunately, there are really good scholars. I think the best one uh, writing on this subject is Sean McGrath, who wrote a a really terrific book that shows quite unequivocally something that anyone who's serious about Heidegger knows, which is that he was a real liar about his own debts. And that's something I found in my own work. And I found to my great relief, McGrath had also provided an enormous amount of data in his own area of expertise, comparing Heidegger and scholasticism, and just as I had found in my area, comparing Heidegger and German idealism and Kierkegaard, where I found he had stolen so much very clearly deep ideas, not just words, but he had really taken deep ideas, which is normal, but then he had explicitly claimed he hadn't done that. Um, he always tries to minimize, for example, Kierkegaard and his authorship. And I've looked in uh, different places and most of the places he discusses Kierkegaard, and it's always a very anxious, very weird thing, which from a psychoanalytic standpoint, it's so obvious that Heidegger is wrestling with a kind of obvious sense of this person so important to me, and I cannot talk about it even to myself, how important he is. So the scholastic bit in Heidegger is easy to miss because Heidegger will make it easy for his reader to miss. Um, and I'll discuss this in many different ways and um, repeat this in different contexts throughout the course because it's quite important. Heidegger should not be taken at his word. Um, he is a more unusually unreliable philosopher than philosophers generally are. And you could say that philosophers, like most writers, are not always the best representatives of themselves. However, you need to very quickly come to some basic sense of, should I trust this philosopher's self-characterization or shouldn't I? And in the case of Heidegger, of course, you always need to take his self-characterization seriously, or else you won't understand how he thought about himself. But in general, I would say, especially when it comes to Heidegger's intellectual debts and where his philosophy is coming from and what it's concerned with, you should not trust him. You should simply read the work and read people who study his work who are deeply aware of the intellectual traditions that he is actually indebted to, regardless of what he says about them. Um, so again, I think if you're going to read one book, read McGrath's book on Heidegger and Scholasticism on that, on that subject. So as to then what kind of book is Sign in Sight, as we're getting into this more immediate and also broader context so we can work towards a direct interpretation, the context academically is phenomenology, broadly speaking, but phenomenology in the context of uh, early 20th century philosophy, which is an incredibly complicated and exciting standpoint. Now, I said that there's always two contexts um, when a person's written an academic or technical work of philosophy. So the first context is just whatever the academic technical context of their field is at the time, right? So for example, if you're studying Immanuel Kant, you really have to know something pretty serious about the development of scholastic and then Leibnizian, you could say scholastic, uh, 
philosophy in, in the Wolfian tradition because Kant taught those texts as his textbooks throughout his career and they helped him organize his ideas, even in the critical philosophy. And that's just one of many examples. I think you also need to have a deep understanding of Lutheran pietism and things like that. So again, this is an example of the immediate context for the academic interpretation of where a person is in their own academic milieu, because that's part of their historical context. So then you could say, okay, Sam, I get that. That makes sense. Granted, it's very complicated in Heidegger's case, but what's the second inevitable context or tradition that a person's part of? And that is, broad, that is simply the broader historical philosophical tradition, regardless of how the thinker represents themselves in it. So when it comes to the second context, there's an interpretive challenge, which is the interpreter of the figure is limited by their own awareness, interest, and knowledge of, and competence with the historical tradition. So one of the things that you want to be aware of when you're reading a scholar, and in this case a Heidegger scholar, is you want to try to gain a respectful but accurate sense of how well that person knows the history of philosophy and under what aspect of interest. Um, let me give an example. You could say a person has knowledge of Plato, and that's only useful if the contrast case is a person who's literally never read Plato. Because there are so many traditions of interpreting Plato um, that it can make a big difference what that means. And I'll give you two examples from the 20th century. Many of the great um, analytic philosophers in the English tradition um, went to Oxford or Cambridge. And many who went to Oxford went to one of the most prestigious colleges in Oxford, which is Balliol College. And many of them read the classic prestigious degree at that college, Literati Maniores, or grades it's sometimes called, I think, which is, quite frankly, an extremely elite, posh degree um, that involves the study at an extremely high level of um, linguistic and philological competence of the Latin and Greek languages, which the average person from the classes that typically went to Oxford or Cambridge, they would have already generally had an excellent reading knowledge from studying Greek and Latin throughout their um, secondary schooling or their primary schooling. They would then sit exams, entrance exams, um, and they would already have very good abilities, abilities beyond what many people in classics PhDs programs now have before they entered their degree. Now you could say, why is this relevant? Well, bear with me. Something very similar is the case in Germany, but the context is totally different. So someone like Heidegger, who went to good German schools and had the equivalent or had the same thing as what in modern Germany we would still call gymnasium education, which is the, the part of the German secondary education designed to prepare people for university study. And it is specialized, like somewhat like the English system, it's, it's different in the sense it's not A-levels, but you go, through a, you go through a different school system if you're planning on being in university and if people in your culture think you're smart enough academically to do university study. And unless you do a technical scientific gymnasium, you will still to this day generally learn Latin and Greek pretty well, as well as maybe other languages, because this humanistic classical philology is part of that training. So this is important to know. So in Heidegger's era and afterwards, as well as before, it was very normal for a person who went to university to have already had a knowledge of, say, Greek and Latin that few people now have who aren't professional classicists. Now, when they then turn to the study of Plato, it is an enormous difference between the Plato that Heidegger is studying, for example, and the German university, which is a mix of an extremely high classical philology tradition with very rigorous very, you could say, scientific developments in the history of philosophy. Just to name one great name, Eduard Zähler, who wrote the great, I think, six-volume um, Die Geschichte der griechischen Philosophie, which is still an absolute classic. If you do serious work on ancient philosophy, I'm sure you know Zähler and, and you probably consult his work. But Zähler is just an example of someone from the 19th century, writing, I think, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, something like that, who, who was very relevant in the 1920s, still relevant today. I think DeGreuter has a new um, edition of his work, actually. So this kind of level of erudition is different from the kind of erudition you would have had when you read Plato at Oxford in, in a place like Balliol. And frankly, one of them is a lot narrower than the other, but they all serve certain interests. And so it's very important to understand this because when you read, as we'll see, I'm going to do some pretty detailed commentary when we get into the text itself on Heidegger's um, use of terms like metaphysics and his references to Plato, 
and Aristotle. And Heidegger has two distinct contexts that he's doing that out of. One is he has a scholastic context from his early education as a young man and a teenager. And two, he has his German university education that has to do with reading classical and philosophical scholarship by leading technicians or specialists in the history of ancient philosophy from his own era. And what's important for you to know is that in Germany, um, you would be very typical to be a scholar of neo-Kantianism who wrote books on modern physics as well as essays that were specialized studies on Plato using the original Greek and all that. And that's similar to, in one sense, what people from Oxford or Cambridge were often able to do, but quite frankly, the German range of academic interest that I mentioned in the first lecture, it is, it is pretty incomparable at this period, certainly even to England, which has a wonderful tradition of humanistic learning. But the, the German tradition at this point is self-consciously specialized and yet also self-consciously synthetic. And so it's very normal for scholars to have multiple specializations in a way that's pretty unfathomable for contemporary um, academics, particularly in the United States system or the UK system where we, you tend to specialize very early and it's not nearly as common to have, in a sense, two, three, four, five, six, seven specialties that you could write very detailed monograph quality studies in. But in Germany, this has always been, quite frankly, normal in the German university system. So that's the, that's the context. So the first context is you want to know about this academic world that the text is coming out of. The second context is you want to have an understanding of what is the broader framework of the history of philosophy that Heidegger is in. And to that question, you then have to ask the question, well, does the thinker see themselves consciously in a tradition? And if so, you then have to address that question. And then if not, you have to sort of do all the work yourself. Now, as you may not know, if you've never read Heidegger, but you probably do know this, if you have, Heidegger is a very strong sense of himself, evolving, arguably contradictory, but consistent. He has a very strong sense of himself in terms of where he stands in the history of philosophy. What you must understand is when a person posits themselves in relationship to the past, this is always an act also of self-positing, to use the Fichtean language. That is, it is a positioning of oneself. It doesn't mean it's arbitrary. It might be arbitrary. It might be unjustified, but it is always a assertion of positionality. And when you assert positionality, you assert a matrix in which a position can be constructed and understood. And when you assert that matrix, you essentially assert some minimal interpretive grid into which you're putting yourself and that grid is also then something you're implicitly positing. So Heidegger has a very big story about philosophy that you can see in his early lectures and in Sein und Zeit sort of indirectly. I'm not going to get into that story right now, but I want to tell you what it has in common with many of the philosophers of his own day. Because this is, again, something that's not unusual. It's not a distinctive feature of Sein und Zeit or Heidegger. It's a common feature of the period he's in that he uses in a distinctive way. What is that common feature that relates to the second point of what is the broader context in the history of philosophy of this work? Well, it is this. At Heidegger's time, it was routine and normal for philosophers to have begun thinking of themselves as the end point of the epoch of the West and therefore to offer synthetic interpretations of the history of philosophy in which they position themselves. Which means it is very normal that you're going to get a kind of from Plato bis Hegel or from Plato to Hegel or from the pre-Socratics, you know, from Thales to Heidegger. This kind of thinking, which seems so big to, I think, often sort of meretriciously shy um, contemporary philosophers, this big context was simply part of, for them, what was a responsible historical self-location because they were academically and philosophically aware Broadly speaking, of the history of philosophy, it was a shared reference point of conversation and using past figures in order to interpret and implot yourself into the living battles of philosophy was a major way of practicing philosophy in the German tradition. You can argue that that's always happening, but in the English tradition, after the demise of British idealism, it's much less self-conscious. The rise of analytic philosophy is frankly this kind of embarrassing thing where a bunch of young people who think they have learned something that their fuddy-duddy professors didn't understand simply dismiss British idealism. But I have no doubt that in just philosophical merits, British idealism in general is a very extremely valuable system. You're, you're, really off, you're well off reading someone like Green, 
more broadly, 100, 150 years later, why is I, I have serious doubts that we're going to be reading um, many works of so-called 20th century Anglophone philosophy, you know, in the 22nd century. But after 100, 150 years, there's works of English idealism that are still worth reading. So the point isn't that you have to choose sides. I'm just telling you as a matter of fact, the analytic rejection of its past was not nearly as self-conscious and it was not nearly as sort of involved in the details. The German engagement with the past at this period in philosophical history is incredibly rich because you already have people like Hegel and Schelling and Kant and the idealist tradition generally, which was telling massively big stories about the evolution of reason, inheriting an enlightenment narrative that they then developed, narrated and critiqued. Um, and also very new counter narratives on, for example, more extreme positions of the conservative wing of things, but also that had a huge arc, maybe an arc of decline, for example, from the Greek world. But it's very important to see that there were certain nodal points in the history of philosophy in Heidegger's own time that everyone was, in a sense, at this point, often positioning themselves in relationship to. And one of the most important of these points, and this is a very complex subject that I'll return to sort of in a spiral fashion throughout the series, one of the most important points is the sort of situation of Plato, Aristotle, and the pre-Socratics. So the first thing that you should know about this in terms of this broader context is that the leading philosophers of Heidegger's day, broadly speaking, the neo-Kantians that he studied under, for example, like Rickert, or people like Diltai, or any number of people, Nautorp, they had a major and influential scholarly philosophical interpretations of Plato, of ancient philosophy, um, generally speaking. And so when Heidegger is talking about Plato, or when he's talking about Aristotle, it is not an insult to him, but simply scholarly decency to recognize that if he's often getting those figures in a way that seems to us weirdly wrong or egregiously innovative in a way that has no apparent merit in the text, one has to understand that it's, you shouldn't assume Heidegger is even interested in what Plato actually said. I'm not saying he is or he isn't, but you shouldn't assume that. What you should assume is like any normal student who wants to assert himself over against the generation of his predecessors, uh, whom he's rebelling against in so many ways, and who he also needs to find a sense of his own value in relationship towards, he's often going to be contradicting, for example, a neo-Kantian Plato that he himself thinks of as Plato. And then he will then reject something, for example, about Plato. And whether that's a rejection of a, an accurate historical reading of Plato that he actually did, or whether it's a rejection of a Plato that he inherited from the kind of scholarly textbooks and secondary literature he would have been reading, that's a different question. And frankly, one needs to answer that question before you assume that we can just go back and read Plato to correct a thinker. That's often only even relevant if we have good reason to believe they were trying to give a genuinely historical interpretation of the past figures. And I'll tell you this as someone who's been studying Heidegger for, I don't know, seven to 10 years in a pretty scholarly way, I, I don't think Heidegger was ever interested in that. I don't think Heidegger was ever interested in giving what a historian would consider an accurate, historically, contextually sensitive reading of the past. He simply was not interested in that. Um, he was very interested in history, and he was exposed to very good readings of the past. But Heidegger was interested in using the past to argue his own philosophy. And that is, I think, in general, that is the normal use of the past for philosophers. Very few philosophers have combined a, you could say, relatively disinterested ability to offer accurate scholarly reconstructions of their predecessors with a conscious philosophical use of the history of philosophy. In general, the use of the history of philosophy, which can be incredibly useful or innovative or interesting, comes at the expense of an accurate contribution to the history of philosophy. And I would say it is an egregious methodological error to take Heidegger's constructions of history as having any historical value. If they have value as, as philosophical, you could say allegories or interpretations. And I think Heidegger was a very profound man, and so he often had interesting insights. But in terms of this question of what kind of text is Zion insight and what is its context, we have to understand that this second level of context, where it stands in the tradition of the history of philosophy, is self-consciously in relationship to the whole sweep of the history of Western philosophy, 
with a particular acute self-consciousness of a few nodal points, the most significant of which is the pre-Socratic and Greek philosophy generally, like Plato and Aristotle, and then, as you can see in Heidegger's own work, a few key modern figures, the usual suspects, like Descartes. What you will find notably absent is any extended engagement in Heidegger's corpus with some of the thinkers who were most important to him, like Kierkegaard. So in a later lecture, when I deal with Heidegger and existentialism, I will make reference to a lecture that I think has still not been translated, in which Heidegger gives a seminar on existentialism, and he uh, says some of the most revealing stuff he says about his own relationship to existentialism and to Kierkegaard. Um, but in that explanation of Kierkegaard, you get some hint at why Heidegger could never bring himself to offer any kind of very ex detailed expositions of Kierkegaard's work, even though he did that with countless other figures who influenced him less. So when we're dealing with Heidegger, this is, as you can see, why Heidegger is difficult, um, because his own context is quite a difficult uh, period of philosophy. If you've never studied philosophy before, it's very academic, it's very technical, and it has a lot of just enormous cultural um, complexities bound up with it. So we need to have that sort of basic framework though, just so we know in a way how, we, we have to know what shadows we're gonna be stumbling under or towards, um, because it's, it's gonna be a pretty murky entrance here. We, we have to get a lot onto the table to even get the lineaments of Heidegger's context accurately. So I now want to turn to, in a way, a kind of version of what I said my second point would be, which is I want to say a bit more about the specific things that one has to understand to understand Heidegger. And I'm going to do that by way of now addressing this first question directly. That is, I gave two answers about context for what kind of book it is. It's a work of academic technical philosophy at one level that is self-consciously plotting itself as a kind of major innovation or culminating work in the entire history, intervening at the level even of its major nodal points in the modern break in Descartes, and particularly in the eruption of sort of the fall, as Heidegger sees it in Platonic philosophy in antiquity. However, you could still say, okay, but is there a simpler answer? Yes, the simplest answer is Heidegger's book is a work of metaphysics. However, if I said that, that sounds like I am saying something. But it was better for me to talk for the past few minutes about something actually substantive and specific before I said something very vague. Because our minds are attracted to words even when we have no understanding of them. And most philosophers have this vague sense that metaphysics is something important, and I should probably have some kind of position about it. Maybe I think it's unimportant. If you're a logical positivist, maybe you think it's very important. But the point is, we don't often know what we mean. Okay, so... The direct answer to what kind of book is this is it's a book that is consciously placing itself in the main in the mainstream of the field that at the time was called metaphysics. What does that mean? We've given some hints. You'll get a lot of detail. But I want to now go into more detail about what are some of the specific things we have to understand. And because I mentioned Kierkegaard, I mentioned German idealism, scholasticism, and Plato and Aristotle. Now you could say, well, it sounds like I have to know the whole history of philosophy. You know what? You do. Um, this is something I'm very frustrated at as a teacher. 2,300 years basically passed between Plato and people like Heidegger. And people like Heidegger cared about those 2,300 years. And to different degrees, people in his generation and in his culture actually read. Not systematically in all cases, but they often had a genuine deep interest in and first-hand textual acquaintance, whether in translation or often in the original, with a massive portion of the history of canonical philosophy. And this is simply not the case today, and so we're often uncomfortable admitting how, fall, how far we have fallen from a standard. But I would just say, look, you don't have to hold yourself to their standard, but if you're a scholar and a teacher, you must not deceive ourselves or our students about what they were doing. Um, this was a period of philosophy where it was normal to be interested in and have some wide-ranging sense of what was happening in terms of both a narrative arc and textual knowledge of the major texts in the history of philosophy. So we'll get to the metaphysics in the last part of the lecture, as I mentioned, but I want to talk a bit more about these nodal points and what exactly it means that we have to have an understanding of them. So I'm going to start from the... 19th century and go backwards and that'll take me into the last part of the lecture which was on what is metaphysics or theology in the most basic sense 
and I'll do focus lectures on this um, as time goes on. So Kierkegaard, um, as I've mentioned, is in my view a German idealist, and this is an unusual, it's become much more common in modern analytic philosophy, it is a terrific turn uh, in the past 20, 30 years in which some of just the best work happening anywhere is happening in the history of German idealism. And people are kind of putting Kierkegaard in that context that older scholars had done in the past. So what does it mean that Kierkegaard is a German idealist? Because then it's just like, what is German idealism? So I cannot possibly give you an introduction to German idealism. Um, a German idealism seminar to me ideally should be two semesters anyway, just so that you can do Kant seriously and then do some of the classic work that leads from Kant to the major idealist systematizers. But let me give you a very simple, simplistic, but frankly not uncommon and still pretty accurate narrative of the significance of German idealism. And I'm going to specify this narrative to my own reading of how Kierkegaard relates to it. Okay, so. German idealism, beginning with Immanuel Kant, is a self-conscious philosophical movement to render philosophy rigorously scientific by the means of a systematic self-interpretation of reason. Okay, that is quite complicated. So I'm going to say it now at a simpler level that sounds more like an intellectual history book, and then I'll return to what I just said. Here's the simpler level. The Enlightenment is about the supremacy of reason over all other authorities, the supremacy and the autonomy of reason. That's how a scholar as great as Fred Beiser puts it. Seems to me still the best way to put it. So that's what Kant is about, right? His famous definition in his Was ist Aufklärung, what is Enlightenment, is it's you 